I have had the most good fortune for the past 33 years to be studying one of the world's most amazing primates. They're called the Muriki monkey, and they actually are found only in the Atlantic forests of southeastern Brazil. The Muriki is the largest non-human New World primate. And you can see from their bodies, their beautifully long arms, their beautiful long legs, their prehensile tails make them perfectly suited for life in the trees. The Atlantic forest of Brazil is a completely separate ecosystem from the Amazon. And when people think about deforestation, when people think about endangered species, they often think about the risks of uh, what will happen to the rest of the world. But in the Atlantic forest of southeastern Brazil, more than 90% of it has already been destroyed. So this is a place where we actually, oops, this is a place where we've actually been struggling for figuring out what is happening to the Muriquis. And there are two species of Muriquis. I've been studying one of them, the northern Muriqui. Nothing was known about them at the time that I started my work. And this was actually one of their greatest attractions to me because I was interested in understanding about the behavioral ecology of humans. And Muriqui has provided a really interesting and different comparative analysis, a comparative perspective, a little bit different from the other species that are more closely related to humans, like chimpanzees and bonobos, which we know are different from humans. And so Muriqui was were going to give a model, a way to extend those questions out. But I had no idea at the time, no one did, that they would turn out to be such extraordinary primates. And really, to provide this image, this glimpse into a life of peacefulness, egalitarian relationships among males, among females, and between the sexes, that's so different from our own. In most animal societies, if you open your mouth and show your canines, usually that means you're threatening someone. But when a muriki does it, it just means they're yawning. No one could actually envision what we mean by deforestation until you see the results of it. And this was certainly the case for me when I went to southeastern Brazil for the first time in 1982. I was unprepared for the barrenness of the landscape or for what it would, that sense of sadness and devastation you would have when you would pass through these areas that were still being clear cut and that all that was left on the drive up from Rio de Janeiro into the state of Minas Gerais were these small pockets of forest, most of them little isolated patches on the top of the hilltops. They're what was left over. But there was one forest. It's larger than the rest, and it's surrounded. It's, it's situated on a privately owned fazenda or farm, and it's surrounded by pasture and coffee plantations, but there's still forest there. And this forest is there because of the owner who actually appreciated that value of nature and how important the forest would be in terms of securing, to preserving the water that he needed for his coffee plants. Very foresighted thinking for someone without the kind of formal education that we have today. In honor of his foresight, his family dedicated the, basically transformed the forest into what is now a federally protected, privately owned reserve. It's administered by an NGO, Preserve Muriqui, and it's about 2,400 acres, which is actually one of the largest tracts of Atlantic forests in the state of Minas Gerais, and it also supports the largest population of Muriqui's. Now, when I first went to study them in 1982, almost nothing was known about them. And that meant really trying to figure out how to, how to figure out what they were doing, what, how did they spend their days. So I would find them in their sleeping trees, and then I would follow them through the rest of the day as they would set out and go out to eat. And Murakis, like 
other primates spend a good part of the day eating. And so it was really easy just to follow them and over time accumulate some really good information about their diets. It turns out they're vegetarian. They divide their time between eating fruits and leaves and flowers pretty much whenever different foods are available to them in the forest. Now, it's also true, just like people, that after you eat, you want to take a rest. And that's what the Murakis would do as well. And that was great for me because I needed to rest too. It was really strenuous climbing up and down all these hills after that. But it also gave me a chance, when they would settle down, for me to actually see them and learn how to recognize them as individuals just from their natural markings. They have different coat colors. Some are grayer, some are blonder. And they have very distinct faces. And as a result of studying them close up as individuals, this whole new world about their society began to take shape. One of the most interesting features, of course, was this fact that unlike other primates, they spend a lot of time together, like a lot of time, really close to each other without fighting. In fact, they're always kind of constantly tapping each other and, oh, give someone a little hug. And sometimes these hugs get into these large, large um, puddles of lots of animals want to get into the scene. It's amazing because males hug males, males hug females, females hug males, females hug females. Everybody's hugging. And they spend a lot of time doing this, and murkies would actually spend more time hugging each other than they do fighting. Now, you may have noticed something else about the murkies that makes them also somewhat distinct. And that is that male murkies have testes that are much larger relative to their body size than most the testes of most other animals. And this gives them the opportunity to avoid aggressive competition because if males are going to compete with one another, they can do it at the level of their production of sperm. And so maybe not surprisingly, mating is sort of a public social affair. Lots of males just wait in line to mate with the same female. And what also makes this so interesting is that females and males are the same size. So it's not like males are coercing females into any of this sexual behavior. If females doesn't want to mate at all, or if she doesn't want to mate with a particular guy, she can just get up and walk away without any risks of being threatened or harassed or any other way. I've seen six males wait in line to copulate with the same female in an 11 minute period. Completely peaceful, even in this slide, there is a male to the side just waiting his turn. This is one of the reasons why murakis are called hippie primates, because they're so laid back and they have a lot of sex and they don't fight. During these times, I also got to see how, um, how, how social they were, how dedicated mothers were to their babies. And I also got to see the fact that not only that, but mothers also spend a lot of time taking care of not just their current child, offspring, but their next offspring as well. And the idea that this might actually necessitate, this might actually be something that would be important to study these relationships, gave me the idea that I couldn't do it myself. And so I've been working with a dedicated team of Brazilian students. There have been about 55 over the years. There are four Brazilian students in the forest in Brazil right now while we're talking. At least that's where they're supposed to be. They're all staying, studying the monkeys, and many of them now have become colleagues. They've gone on to study monkeys and other primates in other parts of the world. It's really fantastic. And what they do, they spend an intensive period of training because we don't touch the animals in any way. We mark them with their natural markings. So we have to be able to recognize them as individuals. We have quite an extensive overlap of, um, of, of photo albums of all their individual characteristics. And this has given us a chance to follow them individually from infancy through adulthood. Bernard is one of my favorite males. He's the only son of one of our oldest females. He's also the father of lots of the kids. He, the girls just love Bernardo. <laughs> now, 
This is not Bernardo's mom. This is another female. But she's my, one of my favorite females, Mona, because she was one of the first I could recognize. And I've caught her entire reproductive career. She's in probably a, close to 40 right now. Females take a long time to grow up, and they live a long time. They spend a lot of time taking care of their babies. They nurse them for about nine months. They carry them around for the first two years of their life. They change their social behavior completely to be with their kids. They also, they also won't advance. If the kids take so long to grow up that they, that they won't advance. And the mothers have to spend a lot of time caring their kids and, um, and also helping their kids to develop as they're learning how to locomote through the trees. And they use their bodies as bridges to help their kids get through difficult tree crossings. These kids are really bright, and they figured out that it's possible to actually get their mothers to help them through these difficult tree crossings, even when they don't need it. So there's always a bit of a weaning conflict that goes on. The males stay in their natal groups for life, so they're living, they're growing up with their fathers, their brothers, and their mothers, but their females have to leave these groups, and that actually makes it really challenging because they have to go to um, different parts of the forest, and in this forest, we have two, initially two groups. It's a closed forest, so there are no more females coming in here than there are, um, there's no way for females to get in, they can just change groups. And that has been partly because of this closed forest, we've been able to track all the Murakis in the population. This is just the group I've been studying most intensively and for longest, and you can see that it, they've actually increased the numbers from 22 to 120 individuals over the years. And the same thing has happened to the other Muraki group in the forest, which split on two occasions. So now we have four groups in the forest. And you can see from the areas that they use different colors here, that they're actually occupying almost all the forest. This makes it really great. The population has recovered from 50 animals to 350. That's one third of the entire species of Muraki's in the world. But it also means that they're running out of space. And they've taken us to the parts of the forest where they're more interested in going. And these are the areas that are actually regenerating. These are the places that we are helping to regenerate through a nursery project that the NGO Preserve Muraki, which administers the forest, is involved in. But this takes time. And actually, the Murakis have found another short-term solution to make it through the time until the trees grow up, and that is coming down to the ground. Now, the ground is dangerous. We have big cats, pumas, and ocelot, and we know they eat murikis because we find body parts in there in the, in the scat. But the murikis are coming to the ground to explore foods that have fallen from the trees, and they've also come to the ground to learn about different foods. It's a real opportunity, and they're walking in a different way. On the ground, they're starting to walk more bipedally. In fact, there are biomechanical properties of the Muraki bipedal walk that are very similar to humans. Really fascinating. And they also have this great advantage on the ground for mothers, because mothers can shovel food into their mouth and hold their babies by the tail. <laughs> you can't do that if you're a mother Muraki in the tree, because your baby might fall out of the tree. But on the ground, she's completely safe. It's so amazing to me to watch these animals adapt to this environment. They've increased their population, and despite all the reasons they would have to be more competitive, to turn into normal, aggressive, competitive animals, they've actually retained their peaceful societies. It's really amazing. And it's also really scary, because they've come so far to population recovery but Brazil is having one of the worst droughts in its history. And this actually means that the Muraki's are in great danger. We worry about them in terms of forest fires, and we worry about them in terms of their access to water. So we've had three fires in the last 30 years, and two of them were last year and this year. None of them destroyed very much of the forest, but they came so close that they could have. And we're worried about the water supply for the Murakis because some of the streams and creeks 
that the Murakis depend on inside the forest are starting to dry up because of this drought. And if those streams dry up, that's going to be really challenging for the Murakis, and it's also going to be really bad for the forest. But despite all this, I'm really optimistic. And <laughs> I have three reasons for this. First, the Murakis have shown us that it is possible for small populations of, populations of endangered species can recover. They've also shown us the value of behavioral flexibility. There were all these ideas that animals are so closely tied in and connected to their environments, but actually for a lot of animals, and especially for primates, being able to adjust your behavior to, to current conditions is a real advantage. And third, the Murakis have shown us that peaceful societies can persist over time, and they can persist under even the most extreme conditions. And I have to say that in our current world, where peace is such an idea and so difficult to achieve, it's really hard and really important to have models like the Murakis that we can look to and believe in. Thank you.